Are we all set? Okay, well, good morning. I'm Gary Sondermeyer from Bayshore Recycling, and I have the honor of serving as co-chair of the New Jersey Climate Change Alliance. And on behalf of my co-chair in climate, Martha Maxwell Doyle from the Barnegat Bay Partnership, I wanna welcome you here today to our program on what's on the horizon for implementing New Jersey's climate change agenda. We have an unbelievable turnout today of over 600 participants tuning in. So we thank you very much for, for doing so for this important discussion. For those of you who might not be familiar with the Alliance, we're an organization that's made up of about 60 uh, participating organizations and we've been at work for about the last 10 years in advancing evidence-based nonpartisan climate change strategies at the state and the local level in New Jersey. And we work within uh, all sectors. We produced over 50 reports, which are all available on our website. On um, things like uh, what places and people assets are uh, vulnerable to climate change, the identification of policy options, best practices, and climate projections for New Jersey. And, and as an example, working with Rutgers University, we commissioned the first science and technical advisory panel report, uh, came out in 2016, was updated in 2019. And it's been uh, embraced by uh, the state for planning and regulatory purposes, which we are very, very proud of. We also provide accessible communication materials and convenings like today and we're spearheaded, we have spearheaded the development of decision support tools uh, for New Jersey, or my favorites is under NJ Adapt, the New Jersey Flood Mapper tool, which just provides a tremendous visualization of the future impacts of sea level rise. We are very, very grateful to Rutgers University to have our two facilitators who really are the heart and soul of the Climate Change Alliance, Gene Herb and Marjorie Kaplan. I also want to thank Matt Drews, uh, who was part of the Rutgers team and helped uh, put together today's program. One of the most important things that I can do today is thank our sponsors. We have seven sponsors, and obviously you can't put on programming like this without great sponsors. So let me sincerely thank the Energy Foundation, PSCG, Bayshore Recycling. Thank you, Valerie. The NJM Insurance Group. New Jersey Clean Energy Program under the Board of Public Utilities, Major, uh, excuse me, Mazer Consulting, which is soon to be known as Collier's Engineering and Design and the New Jersey Conservation Foundation. Today's event is part of a series that we began back in the fall as a virtual alternative to our annual conference. Like most organizations, uh, we've had to go to virtual programming and our theme has been New Jersey leading the way on climate change solutions. And our prior sessions from September and October are available on uh, the website and you can uh, click in and, and find that link. And today's program is also going to be uh, recorded uh, as well and available on the website. Obviously, we wish that we were together live. This was our big day, January 22nd, to get together for our annual conference. but. It's just not time to do that. Uh, COVID is still exploding. 25 million cases across the country were averaging tragically 4,000 deaths per day. It's just not the time to get together live, but hopefully in the not too uh, distant future. And our goal is to really just keep uh, the focus on this critically important issue, the crisis of our times on climate change. Before we get started with today's program, I do have some exciting news. This is hot off the press. We just confirmed our next two speakers, and I'm very excited, thrilled to uh, report to you that uh, next week on Thursday, January 28th at noon, we're gonna have Lisa Jackson, who uh, you all remember as an outstanding commissioner of the New Jersey DEP, certainly one of the most uh, dynamic and amazing people I ever had the honor of working for and with. Uh, Lisa also served, of course, as administrator of US EPA for four years under President Barack Obama. Uh, her current title is Vice President for Environment Policy and Social Initiatives with Apple. And Lisa is going to be speaking to us on the topic of the business of climate action. 
you really don't want to miss that program. The following week on, uh, excuse me, February 4th at 10 o'clock, we have another very engaging speaker in Ms. Cyrilli Patel, who is the director of the Center for Climate and Health Equity of the American Public Health Association. And Cyrilli will be speaking to us on the topic of advancing health equity in an era of climate crisis. Again, another very, very important topic. Uh, so please remember to register for these events. We're gonna put the uh, registration link in the chat box. And during today's program, of course, we strongly encourage your participation and your questions. And what we'll do is we'll be assembling uh, uh, all of your questions during the session, and then we'll get to as many as we possibly can when we get to the Q&A. It is now my distinct pleasure to welcome uh, DEP Acting Commissioner Sean LaTourette to please turn on his camera and his microphone so he can introduce our most distinguished first guest, who is Governor Phil Murphy. And who better to address this, to address this magnificent group of over 600 people today than our governor on the important topic on what's on the horizon for implementing New Jersey's climate change agenda. Uh, so commissioner, thank you so much for being with us today. We're really honored that uh, you're taking the time to be with us and please take it away. Gary, thank you. Uh, and thank you to the Climate Alliance and to, to Rutgers and especially uh, to, to Gene Erb and to Marjorie Kaplan. It is a great honor to be here today with our partners in the fight against climate change. And when I say partners, I mean everyone, every last resident, every last visitor, every last business, every last institution, public and private, because we all only do this work together. From day one, Governor Murphy has been a staunch proponent of New Jersey's environment. He made environmental protection a top priority for his administration and his commitment to safeguarding and improving the quality of our air, our water, and our land is something that we all share. As many of you know, climate change is the single greatest environmental threat we face in New Jersey and indeed the world. Under Governor Murphy's leadership, New Jersey has prepared a climate action roadmap that is among the most aggressive in the country, which has put the Garden State at the forefront of reducing and responding to the threats of climate change. Our comprehensive climate policy endeavor is motivated by two primary and complementary components. The first, mitigation, reducing the emissions of climate pollutants that fuel climate change so that we can mitigate against rising temperatures, seas, and storms in the future. The second, resilience and adaptation, strengthening New Jersey against adverse climate impacts through climate resilience planning and supportive regulatory reform. Unfortunately, Governor Murphy couldn't join us live today, but given his deep commitment to progress on climate, he wanted to share his thoughts and his thanks to our gracious Rutgers hosts for your important work in combating climate change and was able to pre-record this video message. So it is my honor to introduce our governor, Phil Murphy. Hey everybody, Governor Phil Murphy here. It is my honor to participate in this year's New Jersey's Climate Change Alliance Conference. And I wanna thank Sean LaTourette for his kind introduction and Gene Herb for the invitation to be a part of today's important program. I know I'm preaching to the choir when I say that here in New Jersey, the effects of climate change are already felt. We recognize this reality and therefore have not waited for national leadership to act on this urgent matter. In the past two years, our administration has committed New Jersey to reaching 100% clean energy by the year 2050. We've committed to 7,500 megawatts of offshore wind by the year 2035, and we have enacted our nation's strongest environmental justice law. We became, in addition, the first state in the nation to incorporate climate change across all K through 12 education standards. And over the past year, we've made bold moves to make New Jersey the center of the offshore wind industry in the entire United States. The wind turbines that will be built 
uh, and, and be off the New Jersey coast will not only generate power for hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses, they'll also generate thousands of green economy jobs in South Jersey, the New Jersey wind port, and the first investment in offshore wind component manufacturing will bring us up to 2,000 good paying, overwhelmingly union jobs to our state, along with hundreds of millions of dollars in new investments. We are making choices based on science and reality. And those choices will propel us into a healthy future for our environment and our economy. I could not be prouder of New Jersey as we take proactive, meaningful steps to combat climate change from every angle. Again, there's no denying that we are in a difficult place right now, but I could not be more optimistic about our future. The choices we are making today will create opportunity, prosperity, and health for every generation to come. And as we move into the new year and look toward the future, I thank each and every one of you for being our steadfast partners in all of these initiatives. Thank you, each and every one of you, and God bless you all. We are extremely grateful to Governor Murphy for joining us today and reminding us of just how New Jersey is leading the way on climate change. And uh, really just his personal engagement means so much. And on behalf of the Alliance, we most sincerely thank him for accommodating us in, in this most extraordinary time in our history. During the first event we had in our annual um, uh, conference uh, series, we were most fortunate to have Commissioner Catherine McCabe with us and President Joe Fiordeliso from the Board of Public Utilities, who provided us with a state policy update on climate and energy issues. And really given the rapid pace of development of our climate change agenda and our uh, policies, and in particular, the release just uh, this past October 15th of New Jersey's Global Warming Response Act 80 by 50 report, which I personally think is absolutely outstanding. Uh, we are most fortunate, as I said earlier, to have Commissioner Sean LaTourette with us today to provide a deeper dive really on what's on the horizon for implementing, and again, I stress implementing uh, New Jersey's climate change agenda and immediately uh, prior to his appointment, uh, Sean served in a dual role of Deputy Commissioner and Chief of Staff at the EP. And Sean is a lifelong New Jerseyan and has his undergraduate and law degrees from Rutgers University. Uh, we wanna remind folks during uh, Commissioner's presentation to use the chat box to put your questions. So without further ado, Commissioner, please take it away. Barry, again, thank you. Given that it's my first week as New Jersey's Acting Commissioner of Environmental Protection, I must begin by reflecting on what an incredible honor and awesome responsibility this role is. I'm grateful for Governor Murphy's confidence in my leadership and for the outstanding people of the DEP, nearly 3,000 career environmental professionals who have made the protection of our environment and public health the cause of their lives. Their work impresses and moves me every day. My view of the commissionership is shaped by 20 years of experience in the environmental space, from helping vulnerable communities burdened with contaminated water to counseling infrastructure developers on environmentally conscious development, to litigating multi-million dollar lawsuits over oil spills and legacy industrial pollution to advocating for conservation and restoration of natural resources. And I acknowledge that mine is a sacred responsibility. In New Jersey, the Commissioner of Environmental Protection isn't just a cabinet member and a leader of a high impact bureaucracy, a role critical and of great honor in itself. But the commissioner is the steward of all the natural resources in this state. Natural resources that belong not to the government, but to the people. And it is our responsibility, mine and all of the people at the NJDEP, to hold those resources in trust for every resident of this state, to preserve, to protect, and improve upon their quality. So I see our duty to reduce and respond to climate change through that same lens. It is, at bottom, 
a responsibility to the people. And that being, again, I, I thank Rutgers and the Climate Change Alliance, Gene Herb and Marjorie Kaplan for being such great por- partners and importantly, for ensuring that climate policy was taking shape in New Jersey, even when DEP was limited as a result of political wins and how it could engage on this critical issue. It was the Climate Change Alliance in 2016 that initially requested a science and technical advisory panel to be convened to synthesize information on sea level rise and coastal storm issues in New Jersey. And and when the Murphy administration took office, RDP recognized the importance of that work and asked staff to update their reporting with New Jersey specific sea level rise projections for the coming decade, capitalizing on the strides their science had made. The DEP considers the 2019 staff report and its projections as the best available science a resource for sea level rise and changing coastal storm information, it has been absolutely vital in the preparation of our climate action roadmap. We also thank the Alliance for developing NJ Adapt suite of tools, NJ Flood Mapper and NJ Forest Adapt. These powerful tools make your science accessible to us, to the public and to other practitioners. And your ongoing work is and dedication is integral as we continue to move forward to address climate change by implementing our policies. From a planning and regulatory standpoint, we've created real momentum towards clean energy and resilience. And New Jersey is indeed a a microcosm of this nation in this respect. The diversity of our state, its coastal, mountain, rural, urban regions reflects living aspects all around America. And how we craft our response to climate change will provide the roadmap for the rest of the country. But we still have a lot of work to do in helping the public to understand and appreciate climate change, how to change our behavior and to plan and adapt now to impacts that may seem too distant. In discussing that very issue with my DEP colleagues, we often say that addressing climate change requires a culture change. Well, an extreme example we've seen in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, the real heart in our communities, the way people have adapted their behaviors, the way we've stood up and for one another, recognizing that our seemingly small individual actions have a big impact on the lives and the well-being of others. Climate is, is no different in concept. Each of us makes dozens of seemingly small decisions every day with governments and businesses making even larger ones, each of them impacting our environment and our climate and our future. Working to inform and influence that decision-making is one of our most critical tools in combating the climate crisis. And that's why understanding exactly what we're up against provides the critical foundation for developing approaches to deal with climate change. So we like to start as a scientific agency with what do we know in June DEP posted its first comprehensive scientific report on climate change grounded to the experience here in New Jersey, right? With so much science being done all across the world. Some of it may feel esoteric or distant. We wanted to make it real, make it meaningful to our residents, to our visitors, our businesses, our government, our partners across government so that everyone could understand what New Jersey is up against. If you've not yet taken a look at the scientific report on climate change, I'd suggest visiting DEP's website. It has a fantastic executive summary and a lot of detail behind it, but it provides a foundational basis for the decisions that our administration is making today and how we shape the future. We know that we're going to see historically unprecedented warming up to four to from four to five degrees by 2050, resulting in longer and more frequent heat waves that impact larger geographic areas as just one example. Annual precipitation increases from seven to 11% by 2050. And we're already seeing more intense rain events with a resulting increase in localized flooding. This this has led, we believe, to increases in the frequency and, and, and intensity of issues like harmful algal blooms, likely disrupting swimming and fishing in New Jersey's lakes, 
and posing risks to drinking water reservoirs. At the same time, we need to prepare for more dry periods. Periods between rain events may be longer, causing more frequent drought conditions, possible lower water supply availability, reductions in agricultural capacity, and economic lo loss from impacts to livestock and reductions in hydroelectric power production. Sea level rise is among our greatest threats. By 2050, there is a 50% chance that sea level rise will meet or exceed 1.4 feet and a 17% chance that it'll meet or exceed 2.1 feet, resulting in increased coastal flooding during sunny days and storm events that will impact infrastructure, residents, and businesses. And sea level will rise even further by 2100, even if our current efforts to reduce the emission of climate pollutants are successful. Still, we could see sea level rises more than three feet by 2100, and there's a 17% chance that they could be even more than five feet. Whenever I'm talking about climate change, I love to use our DEP uh, virtual backgrounds and look at Island Beach State Park, a place that I love, that my children love, that I hope many of you love. And I ask myself, what are we doing today to protect this place and all the places that we love. So today, what I wanted to take everyone through was a picture of how the different initiatives that the Murphy administration has underway are connected and building upon one another. So I'm gonna share my screen and walk you through a number of those things. Hoping everyone can see that. We have a number of initiatives, as I mentioned at the forefront, that are organized between two primary principles, as I mentioned, the reduction of climate pollutants and the building of our resilience and, and, and means of adaptation. Executive Order 89 is one of the governor's uh, initial executive orders that relates to climate resilience. In that executive order, we, we were tasked, we at DEP were tasked with establishing our flood and climate resilience program, as well as pointing the state's first chief resilience officer to prepare the state's climate resilience strategy, which is a long-term effort to improve upon New Jersey's readiness to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Then early last year, Executive Order 100 is what prompted DEP to begin the largest regulatory modernization effort the agency has seen in more than a decade. Building upon the concepts in the energy master plan and working to implement them. In that same vein, as a partner to the Energy Master Plan, DEP released just this October, the Global Warming Response Act 80 by 50 report, which details how New Jersey has fared in reaching its mandates assigned by the legislature in 2006 of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 20% by the year 2020, and how we stand as a matter of policy, how are we positioned to meet the more ambitious goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the year 2050. We also rejoined the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and have jump-started the state's offshore wind industry. I won't ask you to pay too much attention to this. It's a part of how we organize ourselves among all of these different initiatives. We've talked about sea level rise. The scientific report on climate change was an initial uh, document that we will be updating every, at least every two years. If you have not yet had a chance to review, as I mentioned before, please nj.gov nj slash DEP slash climate change. Please download and read this document. The Interagency Council on Climate Resilience. 
working on our long-term strategy, while at the same time, DEP is working on the first phase of regulatory reforms. The Interagency Council on Climate Resilience is composed of multiple executive level agencies who are working together to identify all of the areas that we must, as a matter of law, a matter of regulation, a matter of policy, a matter of grant making, all of the mechanisms of government that we must begin to change in order to facilitate our adaptation. So what do I mean by that? The climate change resilience strategies broken down into these primary sections, introducing the issues of course and, and going through the science and how we respond and setting up a framework for how we respond to climate change and then using as our first major paradigm how we build resilience along our coast through the Coastal Resilience Plan. This work is being done under the guidance of the state's chief resilience officer, Dave Rosenblatt, and the chair of the Governor's Council on Interagency, uh, on the Interagency Council on Climate Resilience, his chief policy advisor for Environment and Energy, Jane Cullen. With respect to responding to climate change, the strategy seeks to support five major priorities, how we can build upon and support science, how we need to adapt our regulatory and legal environments to build resilient and healthy communities, how we can strengthen the resilience of our ecosystems. So importantly, how we promote coordinated governance since none of us can do this work alone. And how we can expand resilience through funding and financing. Again, each of these are long-term prospects. The strategy itself won't change law. The strategy itself won't change regulation, but it, it will provide the framework and the path forward for all of those things being constantly revisited and its implementation uh, being, being tracked to the public. supporting and sharing the science, as I mentioned, building healthy and resilient communities. For example, how we can support local capacity to integrate and incentivize resilience and address the vulnerabilities of existing infrastructure. And this is especially important in those areas of our state that we know are more susceptible to risk. Just like how we know certain of our communities are more uh, are, are, are disproportionately impacted by the pollution that we all together create, we know that certain communities are likely to suffer the worst impacts of climate change from things like the urban heat island effect. We must design the structures to help alleviate that burden and deliver climate justice. We have to build upon the strength of our ecosystems. We need to maximize, for example, the, the, the absorptive ability of our uh, blue, blue carbon sources in the state through our salt marshes, for example, that on the one hand, we know we stand to lose as a function of sea level rise. We have to work through the framework through which we will migrate and adapt those very important environmental features. The key role that this council will play in forming policy, working together with our 565 municipalities, again, since no one of us is in this alone, there's no doubt, no question, that climate change presents an incredible economic risk, one that we can't put off. We need to identify those strategies and begin building the public support, begin building the coordination among different units of government to maximize our ability to invest in, in resilient solutions. And the Coastal Resilience Plan, the most detailed path of all in this first iteration of the strategy, 
will be to will, the focus of which will be to address the significant vulnerabilities throughout our coast, the risks, particularly to our tourism industry, which drives so much of our economy. In addition to the work of the Climate Resilience Plan, we are working on New Jersey Protecting Against Climate Threats, or NJ Pact. NJ Pact has two components, each a regulatory reform initiative on the mitigation side and on the adaptation side. With respect to the adapt with, with respect to the mitigation side of our regulatory reform initiative, what we call CPR, I often like to say that we're performing CPR on environmental regulations in New Jersey in order to bring them into the future, stands for climate pollutant reduction. The first phase of our climate pollutant reduction uh, rules are taking shape now following a nearly six month period of stakeholder engagement with industry, with advocacy, with governments, in order to identify how we can, consistent with the goals of the energy master plan of reaching 100% clean energy by 2050, begin to ratchet down our emissions of climate pollutants from multiple sectors of our economy, including through stationary sources, electric generating units, including from industrial boilers, including <clears throat> how we address the issue of heavy fuels, which we know create burdens in our most disadvantaged communities. The, the CPR phase one regulations also examine, will also examine how far we can go to reduce emissions for our largest sector of greenhouse gas emissions, the transportation sector. We're looking carefully at ways that we can accelerate the electric vehicle revolution, particularly by looking at delivery trucks, looking at long haul vehicles in this first iteration. We're also looking at how we can adapt uh, an electrification paradigm as a, through a regulatory requirement for cargo handling. With, as we know that not just at our ports do we see an incredible source of greenhouse gas emissions, but also an incredible source of hazardous air pollutants that impact our most, our most disadvantaged communities. At the same time that we're working on climate pollutant reduction, we're also examining every piece of New Jersey's environmental land use schemes through a reform that we call REAL, Resilient Environments and Landscapes, real because climate change is real. We're examining how we can continue to protect public health and safety in consideration of the climate threats we face. A primary component of this reform is how we look at the realities of our flood hazard area jurisdiction. We know that the 100 year storm doesn't happen every 100 years. The science that we've done, including science with Rutgers, shows us that our flood hazard areas are at greater risk. So this reform is looking at how, as a result of sea level rise, as a result of increased storm intensity, we need to rethink the backward looking uh, FEMA based uh, mapping approach to flood hazard areas, where now we look at storms of the past those storms of the past are no longer an indication of our future. So we have to look at not only how storms are changing, but how sea level rise is influencing those, the impacts <clears throat> on our fluvial areas as well. And what we believe is that when you overlay that increased storm intensity, when you consider that, when you consider uh, the, the sea level rise projections through 2100, that our flood hazard area jurisdiction more approximates the 500 year storm than it does the 100 year storm. Now, that of course doesn't mean that 
we're not going to be able to facilitate development within flood hazard areas, but it does mean that we must at least do what we do now in a flood hazard area in what we know will become future flood hazard areas. We can't look past that fact. So we need to encourage the public, the construction industry, to take a hard look at what's to come and to consider how we can build greater resilience into redevelopment and new development in these areas. Inundation and flood damage, as I mentioned, we must establish this new tidal flood, or rather redefine our tidal flood hazard area, as well as our fluvial flood hazard area. We also need to consider, just by, one of, uh, by means of one graphic, as a result of future sea level rise, the rise we know is coming, not the one that is dependent upon uh, only uh, the, the worst case emissions far into the future, but the one that we know is going to occur because it's a product of the emissions already in the atmosphere. How are we to examine development should it be proposed in this new inundation risk zone, as we call it? So we see current sea level rise, we see future sea level rise, the current 100 year flood elevation and the future 100 year floodplain limit. We have to examine through this regulatory reform how under this new reality, we can retool and better support the development throughout the state of New Jersey to make sure that it can withstand what is to come. In addition to that, we need to look at our urban waterfronts and floodplains, our stormwater management priorities, because as I said before, we're already seeing that increased storm intensity. We need to look at how we're working with our friends at the State Planning Commission to better equip uh, that process, the state planning process with resilience considerations. And we're already underway in that respect, we're working with uh, Donna Rendero and the members of the State Planning Commission on matters uh, that are currently before the agency for plan endorsement. But we need to sow the imperative re of resilience throughout the entire state. We also need to look at how we can uh, better prioritize the use of nature-based solu nature solutions to some of these problems, like, uh, <clears throat> like prioritizing living shorelines uh, and regulating our dune systems. We also need to look at how we can facilitate renewable energy development without compromising our environmental resources, while also encouraging use of green building, for example, white roofs. <clears throat> the energy master plan I won't spend too much time on here because I know we want to take questions. But I did want to get to quickly the Global Warming Response Act report. The 80 by 50 report was released, as I mentioned, in October. And I'd again encourage, like the science, the science report, to go, please read this, at least the executive summary, so you can see how far we've come in reducing emissions and how far we have to go. I'm happy to share that our goal of reaching 20, of reducing climate emissions by 20% by the year 2020, we have met that goal, primarily as a function of the transition from coal-fired energy generation, energy generation to, more, uh, <clears throat> to more efficient natural gas energy generation. But between 2020 and 2050, we have an incredible hill to climb. In order to reach the goals that we have laid out, or rather the legislature has, at, rate, has laid out in the Global Warming Response Act, we must be firing on all cylinders to reduce emissions from our buildings, through electrification, both commercial and residential, by deploying energy audits, 
and energy saving uh, features in our industrial sector by moving forward as quickly as we can to electrify every car in this state. The transportation sector, the electric generating sector, and the commercial and residential building sector are our biggest and most important focal points. We've seen through the Reggie Strategic Funding Plan, or rejoinder to that initiative, that we are focusing on the equitable uh, electrification of our transportation sector. In addition to that, phase one of the CPR rules will look at how we can facilitate uh, a clean truck revolution in New Jersey. And we're also, through that same initiative, looking at how we can ratchet down emissions over time from the electric generating sector, consistent with the trend line of the, of the energy master plan. We're working with our park colleagues at the Department of Community Affairs and with the Board of Public Utilities on how we can begin to electrify our residential and commercial building sector without moving forward as quickly as we can on these three primary areas. Our ability to reach our 80% our goal by the year 2050 would be significantly compromised. So these are our primary areas of focus, but they're not the only areas of focus. Quickly just moving through the vehicles and electric generation so that we can see additional places in the industrial sector, how we can move forward on uh, electrifying equipment and, well, <clears throat> and moving forward to create energy efficiency gains, which are the lowest, the lowest hanging fruit and will, will bear the most, we believe, in this sector in particular. Our waste and agriculture sector, as Gary Sandermeyer and I have spoken about uh, at length, our municipal solid waste sector that generates a tremendous amount of greenhouse gases. How we move forward on issues like food waste recycling uh, is a significant consideration for reducing emissions in this sector. We also have to address our short-lived climate pollutants, issues like methane and black carbon. Through our greenhouse monitoring and reporting rule, where we, where we intend to better assess methane emissions from pipelines, for example, and through our CPR rules, we're looking to reduce black carbon uh, in our communities. And critically important is the work to, that, that must be done on carbon sequestration, managing our forests and our blue carbon sinks. Because I know we wanna take some questions, I'm gonna pause there uh, so that there's time for conversation. Uh, and uh, Marjorie, uh, Jean, thank you again uh, for, for making uh, this opportunity available uh, to the governor and to DEP. We're so happy to be here with you. So Mr. thanks so much. Thank you thanks very for much us. for that uh, outstanding overview uh, and outlining the most comprehensive agenda that the state will be implementing. As you might imagine, we've had a very active <laughs> <app box. laughs> And I'm gonna invite at this point, uh, Jean Herb to moderate our Q and A session. So Jean, please take it away. Thank yeah, it, 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 I have pages and pages of questions. So thank, thank you everybody for, um, for being so active. Um, I will do my best to get to um, as many or all of them as possible. Um, so Sean, um, and I'm going to just kind of bounce around to sort of mix up some topics here. Um, so there was a, a couple questions um, about um, in the state's work on resilience is what are the opportunities to enhance natural systems such as um, marshes and uh, tidal systems? Uh, and a related question about um, how will the state look at beach replenishment, um, which the questioner referred to as an expensive band-aid? And is there the opportunity to look at other projects like the Living Breakwaters Project in Staten Island as a model? We love our coastline. And while it may not exist uh, far into the future the, the way it does today, I don't see us stepping back from beach replenishment 
uh, as a means of uh, making sure that our communities uh, have access to, to the shore that they love. We wouldn't be New Jersey without it. However, we do need to embrace uh, creativity uh, like, like the kind you're mentioning on Staten Island. And this is one of the issues that you'll see discussed uh, in our climate resilience strategy, uh, issues that we're considering both in our CRAP program and as well with respect to uh, the development of our natural and working land strategy, uh, which is you know, the other part of, uh, of the picture there and, and of the other part of your question, Gene, with respect to uh, what are the opportunities to expand on those natural systems. As I mentioned, we need to look at potential migration of wetlands uh, you know, particularly as we see a loss of, of some of those along particularly uh, our Delaware Bay shore and coming up along the, the Barangit Bay. Uh, so all of those issues are very much on the table. What we'll be doing with respect to the climate resilience strategy where, the, where a lot of this discussion will take place as well as the natural uh, working land strategy that'll be developed uh, uh, consistent with, with both Reggie and the Global Warming Response Act is inviting a lot of public engagement uh, on those pieces. Our goal, hopefully, is to see uh, a draft issuance of the Climate Resilience Strategy by Earth Day uh, so that we can take uh, some feedback from uh, the, the public on that. Um, <clears throat> so, so more to come uh, on that, those pieces uh, in particular. Thank you. Um, so there's um, a tremendous amount of questions um, that I will frame as um, asking about um, the transition from a fossil fuel economy um, to one that is based on renewables and energy efficiency and conservation. Um, uh, there's specific questions about um, different um, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, whether that's LNG terminals, whether that's gas pipelines, whether that's compressor stations um, in different parts of the state. Uh, so if you could talk, there's also questions about um, the state divesting, for example, pension funds from fossil fuels. So all kind of in the framework of the question of how does um, uh, a transition, how will the state advance, uh, aggressively advance this transition um, away from fossil fuels um, some folks suggest moratoriums. Um, so, but the general question is, how's that going to happen, and what's the timeline for it? So, uh, the timeline is 100% clean energy by 2050, consistent with the trend line of the Energy Master Plan, as I mentioned. So, how do we do it? Uh, you do it uh, through a combination of regulatory requirements, as we're putting forward in the climate pollutant reduction rules in CPR Phase One. Uh, and you'll you'll see that if not the end of the first quarter of this year, early uh, early in the second quarter, um, <clears throat> we need to send the important market signal of of ratcheting down those electric generating unit emissions, while at the same time maximizing through both our solar and wind programs the generation of energy there. We see we have seventy five hundred megawatts of uh, Wind of offshore wind is a goal by, by 2035. Uh, and we're in the process now, or at least BPU is in the process now of establishing its successor solar program. We need to be moving forward on those as quickly as we possibly can. But we also need to be deeply realistic. A moratorium on all, uh, on any uh, fossil related uh, infrastructure uh, isn't especially sensible when we have an incredible reliance on that infrastructure and will continue to for the long term. And I say that for the simple fact that we are an old, old state. Our building stock, which is dependent on, na on natural gas and to some extent oil, will exist that way far into the future. We have to have a steady plan for transitioning that while also electrifying new buildings as a matter of course. And that is something that we're working on with our colleagues in the governor's office and our colleagues at, at DCA. But the, the answer to my mind is that we have to be incredibly careful and thoughtful because as we move to electrify our transportation sector, for example, we don't want to end up in a space where we've, we've created a greater energy need 
from the perspective of electrification. And we've put ourselves at a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a greater emitting role because now we've triggered dirtier sources from elsewhere on the grid. So we've got to be careful in how we time this with the coming online of renewable energy. And so we're doing that from a regulatory perspective, consistent with that downward trend line you see in the energy master plan. But, Thank you. but there's no question that we do need that infrastructure. Well, we're on this question. There were two questions um, about where does nuclear power fit in um, to, to that trend line in particular, um, sort of advancing the next generation of, of nuclear power. So the, the energy master plan presumes that we will continue uh, having the benefit of our existing uh, nuclear plants here in New Jersey. Uh, that is, there, that contribution is, is static uh, in the projections through 2050. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm trying to go back and forth between questions about emissions reduction and questions about resilience. So, so there's a couple questions about um, what can the state's role be in terms of intervening um, when uh, local ordinances exacerbate the problem by uh, promoting more and more building in, in flood prone areas? Sorry, can you just re rephrase so the, that question? What's sort of the role of the state um, in terms of intervening when local uh, governments um, have uh, ordinances and, and zoning that promotes building in flood prone areas? So our role is to ensure that any development is consistent with our Flood Hazard Area Control Act and the flood hazard area regulations, which we're, which we're seeking to modernize through our real amendments. That's going to include uh, a heightened uh, attention to two primary components, uh, which number one is that expanded jurisdiction, but also the provision of dry access, right? We need to make sure that to the extent a building that is proposed in a, in a flood hazard area, number one, is it is proposed in a manner consistent with the rules that protect uh, people, property, and public health, and that in a time of a, uh, a flood or a storm surge, if we're talking the coastal or the tidal flood hazard area, that there is a means of egress that is not subject to that design storm and that folks will have a way to safety. Those are two of our primary uh, components <clears throat> from a flood hazard area perspective, ensuring good design, a resilient design, which the standards will increase under these new rules, and ensuring that folks aren't left on an island. Mm -hmm. um, Sean, there's a, a lot of interest among the questions about the role of addressing um, equity issues as part of the state's climate policies um, and recognizing that certain communities and certain populations are most vulnerable to climate change. Um, could you talk a little bit about how um, those principles uh, will be integrated into um, all the various uh, climate policies? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad uh, to, to have that question because it is, it is an issue that is uh, very, very dear to me. Um, ha I have worked very closely with all of our environmental justice communities, uh, for example, on moving forward uh, our environmental justice law here in New Jersey, uh, the first in the nation. And that is a product of our, in, in this administration, having an equity lens on everything we do. You know, uh, our, our newest deputy commissioner, Olivia Glenn, who's uh, the first ever uh, deputy commissioner for environmental justice and equity at DEP, um, she and I uh, talk often about how when done well, all of our work integrates the principles of environmental justice and equity. And climate is no different. It's the reason why through phase one of our CPR rules, we're prioritizing mandatory reductions, particularly in EJ communities. Great, thank you. Um, so there's a couple questions about 
um, the role of other agencies in advancing this agenda. Um, so a, a question about, you know, sort of how, you know, even from agencies that might not necessarily be thought of as agencies that um, would be involved in climate work, such as the Department of Human Services. The, the question was about mental health. Um, there's a question about um, how um, uh, Department of Education in terms of the First Ladies um, initiative. Um, also a question about how will, you know, advancing the kinds of things you're talking about requires um, all, all government agencies being involved and, uh, and having investment, financial investment um, to make sure this work will be done. And so how will, will those investments be coming from multiple agencies um, or new sources of funds? Um, so it's kind of this broader question in terms of overall, you know, everybody kind of rowing in the same direction, I guess. Sure. Um, and I think you have a view of that through a couple of actions that the governor has taken um, Executive Order 23, Executive Order 89, Executive Order 100. Each of those have an interagency component. Uh, so for example, um, on climate resilience, the, the, council that, the council is comprised of almost every executive branch agency for this very reason. Our Crow, our chief resilience officer, ha uh, is, has been over the course of the last year in the process of engaging deeply with each of those agencies, for example, uh, with New Jersey Transit and with the Department of uh, Transportation on their resilience priorities and how we, we can work, how we can work together in the future in designing that roadmap uh, that uh, will be presented in the climate resilience strategy. We're doing the same thing with the Department of Community Affairs, for example, uh, the same thing with the Department of Treasury. And we're not just doing that on uh, climate resilience, we're doing the same thing on environmental justice. Olivia Glenn uh, is leading our Environmental Justice Interagency Council, setting a baseline for uh, the decision-making of each of our executive brands, brands agencies getting a baseline of how equity principles are integrated into that decision-making and how we can expand upon that. Each of those agencies being responsible for crafting an action plan specifically on issues of environmental and climate justice. So maybe to tie together a couple questions that we have, Sean, about what's the update on Reggie spending? And then also um, if you could, um, I think for folks who might not, um, be tracking the news every day. If you could talk a little bit about investments in terms of electrification of um, New Jersey Transit buses and, and state fleet. So I can tell you that we're gonna have some exciting announcements to come in that, in that space and in the very, very, very near future. Great. We're going, so you'll see, you'll hear from us on Reggie. You'll hear from us on uh, the Volkswagen Mitigation Trust. You'll hear from DOT, BPU uh, and the EDA. On, on our plans to advance that electrification in each part, very critically, each part of our EV ecosystem. Oh, that's great. Um, there's a couple of folks who've asked questions about um, how do um, citizens uh, offer their input in ways that are most effective, um, uh, you know, beyond this sort of traditional um, attend a public hearing kind of thing. So, one of the things that I'll, that I'll say um, is we have deeply invested in our public engagement and we've increased that investment during, this, uh, during the course of this pandemic where we've had opportunities to more uh, deeply engage because of uh, the, our, our adoption of all of this technology, which if you told me a year ago, we could get a 50 year old uh, environmental bureaucracy to, to perform in, an, in a uh, virtual world, I might have laughed. Um, <laughs> But one of the best ways is to, is to follow the development of these initiatives because there's so much opportunity to provide input and ideas. And so whether it's following us on Twitter, I'll put the, the, the handles in there, there's so many opportunities okay. to engage. That's great, thank you. Gary, I can see that you're giving me the signal here. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jean, for a great job in monitoring. Thank you, Sean. And thank you to everyone for all the great questions that you provided today. And of course, a most sincere thank you to our governor and to our commissioner for your time today and outlining the comprehensive agenda you're implementing. To state the obvious, the New Jersey Climate Change Alliance stands ready to support the agenda in, in any way that we possibly can. 
So let me close today's program by once again inviting everyone to participate next week. Please join us again next week for uh, the Lisa Jackson presentation on the, uh, the, climate, the business of climate action. That'll be Thursday at noon on uh, January 28th. And then our February 4th program with Sorelli Patel from the American Public Health Association on advancing health equity in an era of climate crisis. Again, uh, we will be posting uh, today's program in the next uh, day or two on our website. Uh, prior programs are on the website and this concludes our event for today. Again, thank you very much for your participating and please have a great weekend ahead. Stay safe, thank you.